via telephone. J.B. McCoskey, currently the auditor of the state of West Virginia, currently a candidate for attorney general, and currently on our telephone. Good morning, J.B. Good morning. A couple funny things there. Uh, my first dog was named Sidney Crosby. Uh, and uh, Don Larson, if you haven't read the book Perfect about him, you really should. It is absolutely fantastic. He is a really interesting guy. Good recommendation. I didn't know you were a Penguins fan, by the way. Uh, yes, sir. Big time. We have that in common. So, yeah, and I'm sure where you live, that is not a very uh, popular thing. <laughs> You know, that's true. Uh, but I, I tell you, that Eric Carlson trade yesterday, uh, wow, what a job by Kyle Dubas, the uh, general manager. That was pretty insane. We're going to give you all the players we don't want for the one player you got that's good. <laughs> that almost never works. <laughs> the, new, the new general manager. Yes, what a difference over Hextall. My goodness. Uh, JB, let's talk, baby. Let's uh, first and foremost uh, uh, talk about your final I guess what uh, year as auditor uh, year what yeah. 16 months yeah 15 months to go uh, do you have investigations or audits underway that you are hoping to wrap up before your term ends that are still active yeah I don't really care when they end they end when they're done and uh, if they end under the next auditor that's fine uh, you know we, we are we, we can't base these things on four-year terms, right? So a, an investigation can't be rushed because of politics. It has to be done properly. And I have a team of people who, who do those investigations who wouldn't consider <laughs> ever trying to do them quickly, uh, nor would I ever ask them to. But, yes, we have a myriad of investigations that are happening. Um, I actually sat down with my team just the other day to go through them all, and it took a lot longer than I wish it would have. And I presume these are all city and county governments because you don't audit the state government per se, correct? Uh, unless we're asked to help. Now, the governor recently has been in the news again with some of his uh, financial uh, ar arrangements. Are you involved at all with some of the uh, the, the investigation about the, with the governor and his uh, investments? Or There's loans? No, or loans? Not. Okay. That, well, that is not that isn't part of our purview. Okay. Was your office involved in any of the questions regarding Marshall's baseball field? Uh, were we involved in that? I mean, insofar as as we hold all of the data uh, about how money is being spent, then the answer to the question is yes. Do you know if that has been wrapped up? I don't have any idea. I can tell by your brief answers that you're really not comfortable talking about this situation. It's not a matter of being uncomfortable. It's a matter of uh, being careful. I, I understand. Yeah, but those and, are two very different things. And, and by the way, if you are in that situation, just tell us right off the bat that, you know what, this is ongoing. I can't talk about it, and we're cool with it. Yeah, sure. No, I hear you, and I, and I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you very much. Absolutely. Uh, I want to revisit the decision because we didn't have a whole lot of time to get into it with you when you squeezed us in last week, but I want to revisit the week before the decision to not run for governor and switch to the attorney general's race. Can you go back and explain that one for us again? Sure. I, I just, I, I feel as uh, though, you know, like I said before, politics is the combination of service and timing and, and the timing for me to run for governor wasn't right. And, um, you know, I've committed myself to the service of the people of West Virginia and the attorney general's office gives me, um, gives my desire for service uh, an outlet that I think can be really, really helpful uh, to the people of West Virginia and to, to making sure that the next 20 years are the best 20 years in our history. Uh, JB, this is John Gilstrap. Uh, good morning. The, the switch from auditor to attorney general seems like an awkward one to me as as West Virginia's attorney, essentially, which is what the AG is. Do you have a, a long background in litigation experience, that sort of thing? Sure. So, you know, I've been a lawyer for, I guess, 13 years now. Um, I started working at a place called the, uh, the ACLJ, uh, working on constitutional issues as they related to religious freedoms and um, people around the world being uh, persecuted for their faith. Um, and then I moved on to uh, a couple of litigation firms, one uh, for my father's name, a, a place called Chuma McCuskey and Slicer, where I did insurance defense. Uh, and 
then I went and worked at a, at a place called Stepto and Johnson, uh, where I did um, coal mine litigation and then spent the, the rest of my time there working in the oil and gas space. And then as the auditor, you know, we're also the securities commissioner. We're also the land commissioner. Uh, I'm also the, the, uh, the chief inspector as it relates to our public integrity and fraud unit. So we spend, you know, uh, a pretty significant portion of our time uh, in the auditor's office dealing with, with legal issues and prosecutions and interpretations of the law as they relate to securities and, uh, and to, to the land division. Patrick Morrissey has been pretty proactive or pretty aggressive, I guess, in his defense of, of certainly what he perceives and what many perceive as the, the rights of Americans and uh, to be defended against some of the things that are coming from Washington. I know I've read in your campaign literature you, you feel much the same way. What are the high priorities for you in, in terms of either changing things or, or just holding off the, the demons at the gate? <laughs> I, I think where we are right now um, and where my politics lines up the most is that the federal government, quite frankly, is just involved in our lives way more than it should be. And it would be my goal to find uh, some creative new avenues to ensure that we are applying the federal government's constitutional role in the daily lives of Americans appropriately and ensuring that people have uh, the level of, of freedom, both of speech and action, uh, that I believe our founders intended. So put some meat on that. What, is, what policies or, or what, what changes do you expect to make along those lines? Sure. I mean, and I think that, that is a, that's a, a conversation that's going to take a lot longer than we probably have for the radio. Um, but it, it has been, there was a, just, to give a specific example, the Rehnquist Court uh, was very, very keen on working through how the government regulates uh, certain business-related activities through the Commerce Clause, right? Like, can you regulate uh, the, the manufacturing of alcohol uh, on a, if it is not being transported across state lines? Just things that, uh, along those in that, in that realm. And I think it's been about 30 years since we've really looked back at what are what are we doing from a business standpoint um, that may or may not be overregulation by the federal government? And I think uh, putting together a great team of people in the attorney general's office will help us uh, identify those issues and, and continue to pursue uh, continue having West Virginia be a leader uh, while being small uh, in the country in ensuring that that people have the rights that they are designed to have by our founders. And I'd be doing a disservice to my friend Matt Harvey if I don't ask this question. There's been a, a push among some to change the uh, role of the attorneys general, attorney general's office to be involved in local prosecutions. Where do you stay, stand on that? Yeah, so uh, you know, I am a small government um, originalist in, in many respects. And so you know, here in West Virginia, our, our attorney general's office already – uh, plays a role in assisting our prosecutors and assisting our law enforcement um, with uh, interpretations of the law. And I think that that is more than sufficient and that the prosecutorial powers as they exist should not be changed at all. I, I think um, the attorney general's office works on habeas cases, post-conviction. Uh, there's all kinds of ways that this office already works within the criminal justice um, arena uh, but I think that the the actual criminal, the actual prosecutorial power should be left to our 55 county prosecutors. Admiral. Yeah. Uh, JB, good morning. Uh, a question about campaigning. Uh, you are not overly well known in the Eastern Panel. I've had the opportunity to work with you over the couple last two or three years. I've been very impressed. Uh, but uh, but neither ha are your two major opponents, uh, Mike Stewart and Ryan Well. Uh how do you see that you're going to – and also one other thing, you're, you and Ryan Weld's uh, philosophy are, are, are somewhat similar. Mike Stewart's a little bit different than the two of you. How do you propose to put some distance between yourself and the other two in the Eastern Panhandle? Well, the, the whole idea of campaigning is, is just being in a place and allowing voters to, to meet you, to understand who you are, to understand who your family 
is uh, to understand what your values are. And, and I look forward to being in the Eastern Panhandle a lot. Um, I've been in the Eastern Panhandle a, a great deal over the last six years, and, and I really do hope to build on uh, what has been a, a, a very, very successful set of, uh, of years in uh, working with the local governments there. You know, the, the, I work with the city of Ranton and the city of Martinsburg, and I work with the city of Charlestown, and I work with the city of Shepherdstown, and I work with the county governments in, in Morgan, Berkeley, uh, and, uh, and Jefferson all the time. And so my hope is, is that uh, through that great work that our office has already had, uh, we will have a, a really great foothold out there in the Eastern Panhandle. What are some of the differences that you uh, you see between yourself and, let's say, Mike Stewart first and me, Griff, to Ryan Well second? Yeah, I, I mean, to be fair, I, I am running for attorney general, not against anybody. And so I'd rather sort of talk about what it is, is, is that my vision for the office, because, um, you know, those are those are guys I respect. And, and I would it, it, it's my personal philosophy, especially in a, in a primary for us to, to, to tell the people who who and what we are and what we want to be doing. OK, uh, so. uh, uh... Your your opponents, uh, at least uh, Mike Stewart, has been less reluctant to take that approach. He's been fairly aggressive, uh, not only uh, against Ryan Well, but also against you up to this point in time. Yeah, that just isn't the approach that I'm going to take here. Um, you know, I believe that I have a set of skills uh, and a philosophy and an ability to govern uh, that will make me a really great attorney general. And I hope that the, the voters of West Virginia particularly the ones in the Eastern Panhandle, will see that. Um, and I'll be able to serve for uh, in, in this new role. And if not, you know, at the end of the day, um, I've got a, a beautiful family and a wife that I love, and, and we've got careers. Uh, I, you know, I, I am I'm, I'm losing doesn't <laughs> – let me say, say it this way. My, my mother always told me that great politicians fear losing and bad politi- – great politicians fear winning and bad politicians fear losing. Uh, with the idea there in being is the day after you win should be the scariest day of your life because that's when you have the responsibility of 1.8 million people on your shoulders. Um, and if you lose, uh, that means you get to go back to private life, and uh, and that should be a lot easier. And and that's really the way that I look at it. I want to get back to something you said very early in the conversation when you're talking about your commitment to service uh, to the community, all very admirable things. You're doing that now as the auditor, and you 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 first put in your hat in the ring for the governor uh, gubernatorial spot, and that the the odds kind of it, it appears that the odds stacked against you, and you decide okay instead of doing that I will go to be the attorney general. Is is attorney general just a, a stopping point for you? You ultimately is is the job you really want to be governor, and then you're kind of. Just saying, well, okay, I'll do. I'll, I'll go for attorney general instead. No, there really aren't stopping points in a, in a service life. Um, to be fair, the, the the more that I get into public service, uh, and the more time that I spend away from my family, um, you know, the, the more I find that that you just you serve as long as as it feels right, and when it doesn't anymore, you go back home and you take care of your family and and you trust that there are other great people uh, in West Virginia who can do these jobs. Uh, and that's, that's where I am. There's, there's a, one of our listeners has a question here on, on Facebook. I'm just going to read it to you um, from Jeff Haddix. McCuskey has been criticized for votes. He had taken in the legislature against gun rights. What is his view? What is your view on concealed carry? Yeah, I was a, a very young legislator uh, when I took that vote, and I had an enormous amount of um, uh, pressure going both ways. And you know, as it's as I voted, you know, looking back, I, I don't know that I made the right decision. What was the vote? If I were uh, the vote was was on constitutional carry, and uh, you know, we we were an uh, an open carry state, and we still are an open carry state and it, it allowed for permitless concealed carry. And, and, you know, I, I got it wrong. JB McCuskey, our guest, he is the current state auditor running for attorney general JB in regards to the West Virginia first funds and the attorney general's role 
in those funds. Does the attorney general have oversight of those funds or does the auditor's office have oversight of those funds in any way? Yeah, the attorney general's office has oversight of those funds. Um, well, I mean, actually, the foundation has oversight of those funds. The 72.5% of that settlement that goes into the, to the first foundation uh, is managed by that nonprofit. Um, and there are a myriad of ways that the MOU delineates that that money can be spent. Um, and it's my uh, one of the, the great things about this office that uh, I feel I have a set of skills that will help me is in management of the disbursement of large amounts of money. You know, through the through COVID, we had two huge disbursements of federal money uh, that were pushed out uh, to the local governments. And, and West Virginia was really a leader in the country and making sure that money was spent appropriately and properly uh, and on things that would change uh, people's lives for the better. And I think we have a really unique opportunity uh, with this fund to do the exact same thing as it relates to opioids. What would be the attorney general's method of enforcing the appropriate use of those funds? Would it go through the attorney general's office first, through the auditor's office first, or in tandem, or, or the auditor not involved at all? So the auditor is, is not involved at all because this money is with a, no, a non-governmental nonprofit. So the uh, the people who are on that board and appointed by the, the governor and, and various other ways uh, will be in charge of spending that money, and they will be in charge of uh, ensuring compliance with the, the MOU uh, with the attorney general's office. There are some who disagree that the attorney general would have any say in how that money is spent, JB. Do you disagree with that? Uh, I think it is possible that the attorney general wouldn't have any say in how that money was being spent, but I believe that the intent of the foundation is to involve the attorney general's office um, and their input, but I don't think that they are controlling. I want to get to your uh, position as auditor as your time winds down in this office. You've had a few high-profile cases uh, that you've completed while you have been auditor. Can you run down some of your successes in the position? Yeah, I think our greatest success is that we have made the idea that government transparency and accountability are not just important but mandatory and that every single voter uh, in West Virginia and, and really in the country deserves to know exactly what their government's doing in a way that they can understand and in a way that they can um, access because on election day, uh, people need to understand what the government did with their money. And I think making West Virginia uh, one of, if not the most transparent state in the entire country uh, is probably our greatest success. I think secondarily, moving the, the needle and moving the ball on bureaucracy becoming an efficient and effective place that is um, focused more solely on results uh, has been one of our great um, our great accomplishments, and you know, something that that the next governor is really going to need to tackle. Um, and I'm really looking forward to, if I'm given the opportunity to be the attorney general, uh, to work with the next governor to really start to reform our bureaucracy into a place that that sees every single taxpayer as a customer, and every single tax dollar as being owned by somebody else. Does the auditor have any domain over the budgets and spending of volunteer fire departments around the state? Uh, we do now. So as of, I believe the bill was three years ago, uh, we have to audit every single volunteer fire department on a, uh, on a, a five or six year cycle. And so we are building out and, and providing our volunteer fire departments uh, accounting software so that they can present their spending to us in a way that is, um, that is simple and easy. Uh, and then we will begin to compile all of that information and uh, and deliver it to the legislature uh, in an annual basis. Being I, Real quick follow-up, John, before you go. Being in the position that I am, I get a lot of anonymous tips. They're not anonymous when they're given to me. They're just anonymous by request. And some of those involve volunteer fire departments around the state. Are any of the investigations you are currently involved in involving volunteer fire departments around the state, J.B.? I, I really can't say. That was the deal. I shouldn't say. Okay, That's fine, you, you, but you can neither confirm nor deny, basically, is what you're saying. 
Yeah, kind of as a follow up on that, uh, Berkeley County is somewhat unique have in the past. Okay, so. I mean, you can you can go back and look at the, the the investigations that have been completed and the prosecutions that have been completed, um, and and see that they have in the past involved volunteer fire departments in the very in the very recent past as well. Yes. And, and we have. Go ahead, Bill. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Berkeley County is uh, somewhat unique with the rest of the state in that we have uh, paid and volunteer integrated together, working together. Uh, that presents a complexity of Arlington. How do you address something like that, JB? Well, I mean, the, the complexity just is what it is. Um, but at the end of the day, both sets, both sides of that equation have um, the same general obligations as it relates to how they spend public money and so you are basically taking two audits and turning them into one but uh you know what what constitutes fraud would be the same in both of those arenas um and so it's really more about how you bill it than it is about how you audit it if that makes sense so when you audit a volunteer fire department are you auditing what happens to the the bingo money and the cake sale fundraising money as or is it just the, the public funds that, that they're spending? It all basically gets wrapped up into one audit. Final Especially question for JB. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Good. John, did you have a No, that was it. That was it. All right, JB, final word is yours. Oh, I just really appreciate the opportunity to be on here, guys. I think you do a wonderful show, and um, and I'm really thankful for the opportunity. Uh, and I'll look forward to being out in the Eastern Panhandle and seeing everybody a bunch. Hey, please look us up when you get out here, man. Thanks, guys. Talk Thank to you. Soon. Thanks, JB. Uh -huh.